Hi, and welcome to Watch It Played. My name is Rodney Smith, and in this video, we're going to learn the one to five player game, Expeditions, designed by Jamie Stegmeier and published by Stonemeyer Games, who helped sponsor this video. Expeditions is the standalone sequel to 2016's Scythe, but here you're leaving Europa and heading for Siberia after a giant meteorite crash there, awakening an ancient corruption. Previous expeditions into the area failed to return, and now you're heading into the unknown for untold riches and glory. Although a sequel to Scythe, this is a brand new separate game, so join me at the table and let's learn how to play. To set up, collect and separate these double-sided location tiles, sorting them by their backs, which represent the south, central, and north tiles, and ensure that each of these stacks are shuffled. Then place this base camp in a central area and look at the diagram shown here. This will tell you exactly how the location tiles should be arranged relative to the base camp. And these yellow rectangle symbols are spaces that you should leave empty for now. When you're done, it should look something like this, but just ensure that all the north and central tiles remain face down unseen with the southern tiles flipped face up. On each face down location, now add one of these map tokens. Then set the leftovers in a supply nearby along with the various coins and colored worker pieces. This tray comes with the game, but for these others I'm using some trays that I have. These orange and teal wooden pieces are known as corruption tokens and you'll add all of them to the included bag, except for this 20 value one which you'll keep separate. Now find and shuffle the cards with this back into a face down deck, dealing one face up into the five empty spaces created by the location tiles so it looks something like this when you're done. These are known as the mech mats and you randomly distribute one to each of the players. In this video, we'll assume we have two players returning any unused mats back to the box. As we'll see later, you'll have the ability to improve your mech by tucking cards under it. And to help with that, you can choose to attach these riser stickers to the bottom corners here, as this will give the mat a bit more height, making it easier to slide cards in and out from under it. Each player now collects the mech miniature, matching the one shown on their mat, and chooses one of the player colors, attaching that colored base to its bottom. In your chosen color, you also gain four of these glory token stars, which you store on your mat, along with this action token that you set into this refresh space. Each player also gains one of these power and guile tokens, putting them onto the zero space of this track. The game comes with six unique characters, and each has a specific companion sharing the same Roman numeral value in its top right-hand corner. Players now gain one of the character cards at random, along with its specific companion, setting them to the left of your board. You should also collect a set of the included player aids, which will remind you of the various actions and symbols in the game. You now pick someone randomly to be the first player, and that's the setup. In Expeditions, you and the other players will travel aboard your giant mechs, recruiting various workers to assist you as you explore and uncover new areas, collect powerful items, and clear out the spreading corruption, all in an effort to be the wealthiest player by the end of the game. Your wealth will come from a variety of sources, but in particular, there are goals listed here on the base camp, and players will be able to add their glory stars to them as they're accomplished. And these will provide you with extra wealth based on the number of what are known as quest cards that you accomplish along the way. We'll learn about all of this in detail as we go. Expeditions is played over a series of turns, starting with the first player and going clockwise around and around the table. And on your turn, you'll either take actions or refresh. To take actions, first shift your action marker, which is the cube here, along the arrow into the next adjacent space. And then you must resolve each of these exposed actions that you're able to, move, play, and gather, in any order you choose. We'll learn how you perform each of those actions, as that will make up the majority of most of your turns. But you'll notice I said you must resolve each of the exposed actions. But you'll notice they're all exposed right now, right? And that's true. When you're taking actions and your marker started here and it moves into this box, all of these are exposed, so you'll take all three. But on a future turn, when you want to take actions, remember, you always first have to shift your action marker. And now the arrows direct us to any one of these three spaces. Whichever one you choose, you will then resolve the actions of the exposed spaces, so in this case, we'd only move and gather. 
The next time we take actions, we shift our marker. But once you're up in this box, you now shift it to any of the exposed spaces up here. But just keep in mind, you must shift it. If last turn I was here, I couldn't leave it here and perform these two exposed actions again. I must shift the marker first, and then I resolve my actions. And again, remember, you must resolve each exposed action that you're able to. So with that in mind, let's go through each of the actions and learn how they work, starting with moving. Moving always refers to your mech, and unless otherwise stated, it has a default move distance of one to three locations. Now notice, I didn't say zero to three. In other words, you must move at least once with this action. At the beginning of the game, all of the player mechs are said to be here on the base camp. And when you take a move, you move one to three adjacent locations. The locations are the various hexes. And the base camp is considered to be adjacent to these three hexes. So on my first move, I might go one, two, and then choose to stop here. After leaving the base camp, you can't go back to it for the rest of the game. Also, after moving, you must be on a different location from where you started the action. For example, on a future turn, I couldn't leave this spot and then come back to it on the same turn. You also can't move into these open areas with a card in them. Now, once other mechs are on the board, you can move through their locations, but you must end your turn on an unoccupied one. As I mentioned, you must always resolve the exposed actions on your board if you can. In the very rare case that you can't move your mech to a valid location, you can still resolve the move action, but in that rare case, it just stays in that location. When moving, you're free to enter a face down tile, but as soon as you do, your movement ends. You then gain the map token from that location. Store these on your mech board where they're now referred to in the game as maps, and we'll see how these are used a little later. Now flip the face down location tile that you moved into face up. Then take note of the value printed just to the right of the dashed outline space on the tile. In this case, we see five plus. From the bag, you now, one at a time, randomly draw what are known as corruption tiles and stack them on the outlined space until their total value is equal to or higher than the value printed here. This is a three, so I'll draw another. And now we're at a total of seven, so we'd stop. If the corruption bag is ever empty when you would need to draw more tiles, just stop drawing and leave the location as it is. I'm now gonna reveal the Tarkovsky's Lair tile. And when this is revealed in the game, instead of drawing tokens from the bag, you place the value 20 corruption tile here that had been put aside during the setup. In the game, mysterious meteorites have been crash landing into this area of Tunguska, and it's awakening an ancient evil that these tokens represent. And we'll learn more about them later. But with that, we've now covered the rules for the move action, so now let's learn how the gather action is resolved. With this, you gain the exposed benefits at your mech's location, represented by the symbols found here at its bottom. Now I say exposed because as we saw, some locations may have corruption tiles which cover up symbols. As we'll see later, these can be removed, gaining players access to the symbols underneath. If there's more than one benefit symbol at a location, resolve them in any order. But if a location's benefits show a slash, you choose the benefits on one side of it or the other. So let's go through the different symbols and see how they work. As we do, just keep in mind you'll find reminders of how these work right here on your personal player aid. Each of these symbols represent one of the five different types of workers. Thematically, the blue are engineers, yellow are merchants, green are explorers, red are soldiers, and the purple are the possessed. When resolving a worker symbol, you collect that colored piece from the supply and add it to your mech map. There's no limit to how many workers a player can have over the course of the game, but there are only 10 of each color. So if a benefit would let you gain a worker and there are none of that color left in the supply, you get nothing. This tile provides the gain a face-up card benefit. Any effect that relates to face-up cards refers to the ones in the five open spaces between the location tiles. So this means we pick any one of them to gain no matter how far they are from our mech. Now that said, if the gain a face-up card benefit shows a star in the center, that means you must gain it from a spot adjacent to your mech. So in this case, any one of these three. No matter where the card is taken from, anytime one is removed from a space during the game, immediately replace it with a new one drawn from the top of the deck. 
A very important aspect to these effects is that they are said to gain you a card, which is a term we need to discuss. Cards you have will either be face up to the left of your mech mat in an area known as your hand, or to the right of it, which is where your active row will be located. We don't have any cards in our active row right now, but I'll add one here just for the sake of this example. Anytime you gain a card, you add it to the right of any other cards already in your active row. Cards you gain will have symbols and other benefits, but these are not resolved when they're gained. Only cards you play, which is an action we'll learn about later, provide you with their benefits. So again, cards to the left of your mat are said to be in your hand, and cards on the right are in your active row. When gaining a card, add it to the far right of your active row, while cards in your hand can be arranged in any way that you like. And just to make sure it's clear, you will never literally hold cards in your hand in this game. The cards in your hand are always set face up, clearly visible to the left of your mech mat. So as we learned, the symbol on this tile lets you gain a face up card. On this tile, we have two different symbols and we're gonna focus on this one, which simply lets you gain a card. This is taken from the top of the deck and since we're gaining it, it means we add it to the right of our active row. And as we learned, this also means we don't resolve any of its effects. When resolving this benefit symbol, you draw two cards from the top of the deck and pick one to gain, adding it to your active row. The other you add to what is known as the sweep pile. This is a shared face-up pile you'll set beside the face-down card deck. Speaking of the sweep pile, next up we have the sweep effect represented by this symbol. To resolve this, pick any number of the five face-up cards and add them to the sweep pile next to the deck. And as we learned, any time cards are removed from these areas, they're replaced. We saw this tile earlier, but now let's look at its other symbol known as rescue. To resolve it, you rescue any one card from your active row and put it into your hand, closing any gap it might have left behind. And as we'll see later, cards can have workers on them. And if one you rescue has a worker, that worker is first returned to your mech mat, and then the card is sent to your hand. Next up, we're gonna look at two different symbols. This one, known as guile, and this one, known as power. Anytime you have to resolve either symbol in the game, advance your matching marker one space upward on your track here. You can never have more than 10 of each, so if you'd ever gain more than 10, just ignore the extra. Anytime you see this symbol, collect its shown value in coins from the supply and add them to your mech board. The game comes with a variety of denominations, so as you collect more coins over the game, feel free to trade in lower values for the equivalent higher amounts. Also, coins in the game are unlimited, so if you ever run out of any, just use a suitable replacement. When you see this map token symbol, gain one from the supply and add it to your mech map. Resolving this symbol allows you to perform a meld action, which requires you to have a meteorite card as labeled here. This can come from either your hand or your active row, and if the one you choose happens to have a worker on it, return it to your mat. You then rotate and slide the card under the bottom edge of your mat so that only this text here is visible. This is known as a meld bonus, and you now resolve all the meld bonuses you have, including the one on the card you just placed. In this case, we're told to gain $1 for every yellow card we control. The color of a card is based on the color of the worker shown in the bottom left-hand area here. Also notice the effect says we count every yellow card we control. Cards you control are any in your hand and active row, so you don't count any cards tucked under your mech mat. So for this effect that gives us $1 for every yellow card we control, up to a max of $3, we would count these three yellow cards, one, two, three, and gain $3 for that effect. Over the course of the game, you can have at most four melded cards, and remember, anytime you add a new meld, you resolve each meld bonus you have at that point in any order. Resolving this symbol allows you to perform an upgrade action, which requires you to have an item card as labeled here. This can come from either your hand or active row, and if it has a worker on it, just return that to your mat. Then tuck the chosen item under the right side of your mat, so only the printed ability here is showing. Every other symbol on the card is ignored, but this visible effect is now active for the rest of the game. So in this case, from now on, anytime you gain a worker, 
you also gain one power. And you can have more than one upgrade, and all of them are considered active, but at most, you can only have four. So once you have four upgrades, you can't perform the upgrade action again. Now let's learn the benefit of what is known as the boast symbol. To understand this, we need to understand the glory categories of the base camp here. Each of these columns is a goal you're trying to achieve. For example, this is the upgrade symbol. So as soon as you have four upgrades tucked under your mech mat, you've completed this goal. But it's only by taking this boast action that you get to declare the goal as completed. Resolve the boast by moving a glory token from your mat to any one goal you've completed but haven't claimed yet. Just know more than one player can be in the same column. Completing goals is one of the ways you'll earn points at the end of the game, as we'll see. Okay, with that, we now understand many of the symbols you can resolve with the gather action. And there are a few others, but they'll make more sense later when we know more of the rules. For now, let's move on and learn how you resolve the play action. To do this, you pick any one card in your hand to play. And as we know, these are the cards to the left of your mech mat. And after picking the card, you move it to the far right of your active row and then resolve its core value. This is the symbol shown in its top left corner. In this case, we would gain one power, which as we know, moves this token up a space on the track. Some cards also have what are known as conditions showing a requirement, which if you satisfy, earns you extra power or guile. On this card, the conditions relate to glory tokens you've added to the base camp. If you had one glory here already, then you would advance power again. With two or more glory placed, you'd also advance your guile. In other words, with at least two glory, this card earns you two power and one guile. Some conditions provide you with their benefit if you have at least the indicated number of cards melded. That's what this symbol represents. So if I played this card and had at least one melded card, I'd earn this bonus power. After playing a card, you may also move a matching colored worker to its space here to resolve its listed ability. And you can resolve these two areas of the card in either order. Just keep in mind each card can have at most one worker on it. And assigning a worker is optional. If you don't put a worker on it, just ignore this area of the card. If an ability refers to the core value of a card, for example, this lets you gain the core value of all face-up meteorites, then that means you gain both the core value and any conditions you personally satisfy on that card. So if we had at least one melded card, then this face-up aid stone meteorite would earn us two power. Some abilities, like this one, will have an or option, meaning it has more than one ability you can choose to resolve. If we picked the first option, we'd gain a face-up meteorite. There are a variety of different benefits the abilities on cards can provide, and I'll go over a few of those with you right now. Some abilities will instruct you to discard a card, like we see here. To do this, move a card from your hand to the far right of your active row, but you don't gain its core value and you can't place a worker on it to resolve its ability unless the effect says otherwise. In this case, you discard a card but also gain its core value. Some cards, like this one, will have a second conditional ability you can resolve if you have melded the shown number of cards. In this case, if we've melded at least two cards, you're told to rescue the previous card. We learned about rescuing earlier, but if an effect refers to the previous card, it means the one directly to its left in the active row. So in this case, we'd be rescuing this card back to our hand. Some effects instruct you to trash something, either a token or a card. In this case, we're told to trash a map token. To resolve an ability like this, you must have the related thing that it's telling you to get rid of in the first place. And if so, you remove it from the game. Now, removing it from the game relates mostly to when you're told to trash cards. If you're told to trash a map token, like this effect said, you can just put it back in the supply, as these are technically an unlimited resource. If an effect refers to available workers, it means any located on your mech mat. Workers who are already assigned to cards are not considered available. Some cards are known as items, as labeled here. These work a little different, as they have two card abilities. One is an instant benefit which you gain as soon as you place a worker on the card. In this case, we'd be able to perform a move action. But instant effects are optional, so you can ignore them if you want. Items also have what is known as an ongoing ability, which often start with the word whenever. 
As long as this card is in your active row and has a worker on it, you resolve this effect whenever the listed condition occurs, including on the turn that you played it. For example, this effect resolves whenever you move through an opponent's location. So if that happened, when you resolved this move, you'd immediately gain this effect. This effect says to activate the ability of any other card in your active row, and let's say we picked this one. You don't place a worker on it, you just get to resolve its ability here, whether it has a worker already or not. If you're activating the ability of another card and you target an item, let's say this one here, you get the instant effect and the ongoing ability, even if there's no worker on it. But in that case, the ongoing ability only lasts until the end of your turn. Sometimes an effect, like we see on this card, lets you perform a solve action. To do this, you must have a quest card in your hand or active row. And quests are labeled, as we see here. Your mech also has to be on the location matching the quest's number. This quest is located on tile 9, which we're also told is one of the central tiles. So, if we were at this location, then we could complete this quest by paying whatever power or guile cost it shows here. In this case, to power. Anytime you have to pay power or guile, just move the related marker down on the track. When you solve a quest by paying its cost while at the required location, you then gain the reward shown below the arrow. In this case, the symbol here means we gain a corruption token. Anytime you gain a corruption from a symbol like this, take it from the bag and add it to your map. And don't forget, you can solve a quest whether it's in your hand or your active row. And once solved, you collect it, putting any workers it might have had back on your mat. And then you tuck it under the top edge like this. Over the course of the game, you can solve at most four quests. After that, you ignore effects that would ask you to solve a quest. Now let's look at another card ability. This one allows you to perform the Vanquish action. Vanquishing can only be performed when your mech is at a location with corruption tokens. And for this action, you look at the topmost one there. You'll notice that corruption is the same color as guile and power. And this indicates which of those you must spend. And the value shows how much. So in order to vanquish this token, I'd need to spend three guile. After spending the required amount, I collect the corruption token from the tile and add it to my mat. If there's more than one corruption token on your location, then you can repeat this process as many times as you like during the same vanquish action, as long as you spend the required guile or power each time until you run out, decide to stop, or all the corruption has been removed. When all the corruption has been removed, a new benefit is now revealed, which can be gained when taking the gather action at that location. And just be aware, when a tile does have corruption, the values and the colors in the stack and even the covered benefit of the tile itself can be checked at any time. If an ability destroys corruption from a location in any other way, and it doesn't tell the player to collect it, you return it to the bag. This next location is quite unique because when revealed, you add this value 20 corruption token here. This shows both colors because the only way to vanquish it is by spending 10 guile and 10 power. You then collect the token and add it to your mat as usual. With that, we've learned how to move, play a card, and gather, along with several card effects. But on a turn, instead of moving the cube and resolving the exposed actions, you can refresh. To do this, your cube must have been on one of these three spaces at the start of your turn, and then you move it here. Now you return all of your workers in the active row back to your mat, and then move all of the cards in your active row back to your hand. That would complete a turn where you refresh instead of resolving the exposed actions. On your next turn after refreshing, you'll move your cube here and must resolve all of these actions. On your next turn, you move to any one of these spaces as normal and resolve the exposed actions. And with that, we've covered all the main actions. But remember, there were a few gather benefits on the location tiles I'd saved to go over, so let's look at them now. This is a refresh cards and workers symbol. To resolve this, you return all of your workers from your active row to your mat and put all the cards in your active row back in your hand. The only difference between this and using a turn to refresh is that you don't move this cube back to here, it just stays where it is. When resolving this benefit, 
you gain the benefit of a single icon from an adjacent location. For example, if we were adjacent to this tile, I would pick just one of these three icons to resolve. This symbol means you get to resolve an ability from a single card adjacent to this location. You don't place a worker on the ability, you just get to resolve it. And if it's an item, you get to resolve both its instant effect and ongoing effect. But the ongoing effect just lasts for the current turn. This one times symbol we see here on the benefit indicates that you can only activate the selected card's ability once this turn. This prevents players from exploiting any combined effects that might otherwise allow multiple activations of the same card. This brings us to the last symbol shown here. Anytime you see this, it means you get to play a single card from your hand following the standard rules. And remember, your player aides will remind you of all these various symbols and even the different types of actions you can take, which is helpful when you're first learning. The other thing I should mention is that benefits are optional. If you're gathering on a tile, you don't have to resolve all of its symbols that you have access to. Likewise, if you're resolving a card with multiple abilities, you could resolve some and not others. For example, if the card let you move but also meld, you could meld but decide not to move. While playing, you'll also want to keep an eye on your mech board because each player will find they have a unique ability printed in this area that they can take advantage of any time it would apply. Okay, with that understood, we now know how to take a turn. And after you've moved your action cube and resolved the exposed actions, or taken a refresh turn, your turn is over and the next player in clockwise order takes their turn. And turns will continue like this until the end of the game is triggered, which happens as soon as a player has added their fourth glory token to the base camp. Remember, we learned earlier that with this boast action, you can move a glory token from your mech map to an objective here that you've accomplished. So let's go through each of these. For this, you need to have completed four quests. Here, you need to have melded four meteorites. This requires four upgrades, and you complete this quest by having the special 20-point corruption tile. Having seven of the other corruption tiles, not including this one, completes this quest. If you have at least eight cards under your control, that is, in your hand or active row, you've accomplished this quest. And here, you need to have seven workers or five map tokens. Having either of these allows you to place a glory here. If you complete both, you can still only have one of your stars in this column. But remember, any number of players can have glory stars in the same space. Also keep in mind, once you've placed the glory token on the base camp, nothing can remove it from there, even if you later no longer satisfy the condition that allowed it to be placed. Now, once a player has put all four of their glory tokens on the base camp, each player takes one final turn, including that person. And then the game ends, and it's time for final scoring, which is based on your total wealth. First, collect a total value in coins equal to the total value showing here on all the items that you upgraded. Then count all of the corruption tiles you collected and gain $2 for each of those, including $2 for this token if you have it. So in this case, we'd earn two, four, six, eight, ten, twelve dollars in coins taken from the supply. Then gain coins for each glory token you placed based on how many quests you solved as shown here. In other words, if you completed three or more quests, then each of your glory tokens are worth $10. But if you only solved one quest, they'd each be worth $6. In this way, solving quests will make the glory that you placed even more valuable. You now add all the coins you collected together and the player with the highest value in coins wins. If there's a tie, the tied player with the most total items across all the goal categories wins, even categories where you don't have a glory token. In other words, you count up how many individual quests, melded meteorites, upgrades, corruption, cards and workers and map tokens you have, and the tied player with the most wins. If there's still a tie, well, first of all, I don't believe you. Check again. But if there's still a tie, the tied players share the victory. The game also comes with an achievement sheet you can fill in as you accomplish various unique situations in your game. And there's also a full solo mode included as well, but that I'll leave for you to discover on your own. Otherwise, that's everything you need to know to play Expeditions. If you have any questions at all about anything you saw here, feel free to put them in the comments below and I'll answer them as soon as I get a chance. You'll also find forums for discussion, pictures, other videos, and lots more over on the games page at Board Game Geek, and I'll put a link to that in the description below. 
And if you found this video helpful, please consider giving it a like, subscribing, and clicking that little bell icon so you get notification anytime we post a new video. And if you'd like to support us directly, you can join our Patreon team, which I'll have linked below. But until next time, thanks for watching.